Hello, loved ones. I hope everyone is doing well. You are enjoying your day. It's a very beautiful day. My name is Reverend Penelope Stewart. I run the Chemistry Channel. Thank you, subscribers, and welcome new subscribers. Thank you for liking and sharing our videos. We appreciate you, and thank you so much for all your support. You can follow Chemistry on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, although I have not been posting there lately because I've been so busy with other things. Uh, but I said, remember I said I would be coming back here often with more book reviews. And today I have another book review for you. I'll be coming back often to, the book, to do book reviews because I have an increase in resources. So I'm able to share more of my readings with you, some of my self-discoveries with you, and some of the things that Spirit share with me. And today uh, I want to share with you... Cast in the Circle, Diane Steen, A Women's Book of Ritual. Really good book. And they said, why you get that book? Why did you get that book? Well, I got this book because I, you, if you have been listening to me, I don't know if I've mentioned it, but I'm very interested in um, creating a sister circle to help women heal. And um, a healing circle for women and also a sisterhood circle for women as well. So I'm very interested in that, very interested in the rituals. So I thought I would get this book to get more rituals, gain more rituals and understanding. And a very good book. I think this book is awesome. Um, if you're beginning out and you're tapping into your, in, want to tap into your inner goddess, um, and you don't really know which way to go, whether you want to do rituals by yourself or with other women, this is a great book to get you started. I think it was a great book for me. It gave me uh, some insight. Very inspiring. Uh, this is the author on the back. I like this author because she doesn't just address one culture. She addresses cultures all across the globe. She addresses the Egyptian Parthenon. She addresses the Ifa Parthenon. I mean, she she connects with uh, the goddesses all in all cultures, the goddess energy, the feminine energy in all cultures, uh, as we call it today. The book is over two hundred pages. It's like two hundred and forty pages. Um, it's a how-to book as well. We're giving you outlines uh, on the rituals and things uh, in circle casting it has 10 chapters so i want to go into the first chapter i like this author because when i got into this author uh what is her name diane steen uh she mentions this author so her and this author lucia what's her name lucia tish her and this author work together they uh they gained some insights and um, performed some sister circles together. So, uh, and you're, this is an old book, and I know you're familiar with her. I did a back, uh, uh, book review on her. Okay. Uh, another book I wanted to bring up, this is Jambalaya. Okay. The Natural Woman's Book. And she talks about... Um, Different Parthenons as well with the Orishas, the Ifa, Vudun. Uh, she, she talks about a couple of ritual. I mean, um, let me see how I want to say that. Different religions, I want to say, or different spiritual practices as well. But most of them are indigenous, okay? Aborigine. Let me say that. Aborigine. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is a really good book too. I had another book that was really based on African uh, spirituality and focused on Ifa goddess worship, the Iyami. You'll be heard it be called Iyami. Uh, I thought this was a very informational book, Iyami uh, or Soraga, Erisoraga. You know, I'm going to pronounce stuff wrong, you guys. So, I'm not the best person to pronounce things. So, I thought this was a very interesting book. There's a lot of things I connected with in this book. 
Uh, and then there was some things that I was just I didn't really get, and so I didn't connect with it. I didn't resonate with some of the things in here, and a lot of things I did uh, resonate with. So you guys know me. I buy a little everything. I read some of everything. I don't discriminate. If 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 something in there is helpful for me, I take it. If it doesn't work for me, then I'll just leave it. And I think you know that's the way to be when you're trying to find your spiritual path is finding what works for you. And then the things that don't, just say, "Oh well," and go on. So that's what I do. Um, I wanted to read the first chapter to you in this book, um, "Casting the Circle," Diane Stein, because this is what this book review is about. Okay, I'm doing a book review on her. These other books are just reference books if you're interested uh, in those particular paths. Okay, but she addresses a lot of cultures in here, especially when it comes to talking about patriarchy. Uh, when it comes, because I don't hear, I didn't hear, uh, I didn't see that in other goddess books I've read. But when the ancestral mothers were sharing their story with me, she hit on a lot of targets in here. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this, those are uh, some of the very same things that the ancestral mothers shared with me uh, in spirit. So, and she addresses that in, in this book. I love this book. It's a really good book. Like I said, if you're you're a woman and you're trying to find your path and you're trying to tap into your own inner strength and God is, you know... This is a great book to get you started because she doesn't just deal with one culture. She this these rituals in here for is for anyone from any culture. OK, it can be adapted and changed uh, to suit you. Uh, in goddess culture, creation of the universe was seen as happening by birth from the vagina or other creative action of the goddess. This was the beginning of all religion. Women as birth givers and nurturers were the images and embodiments of the goddess and creators of life on earth. They were creations of individual life as the goddess was the creator of the universal, of all species and life as a whole. With, with this idea implicit in society, women in the position of initiators and leaders of culture and politics the creators of their families and tribes as earthly representatives of universal form. Women were, therefore, people of consequence in the early tribe or state. They were mirrors of divinity. You heard it there. What they did had meaning and political, personal influence and power. Then it changed. Okay? Remember, I talked about this. You know, go back and look at my videos on the Amazon Women, that matriarch culture, that was a mighty uh, culture. That was a mighty culture of women. As, as near as archaeology, like I said, archaeologists will uh, prove that this culture exists. Historians, his story is that they did it. It's important and imperative as women because that's, this is where a lot of this power comes from. It comes from the divine feminine. So it's important for you to understand the nature of your power and tapping and tapping into yourself. So, you know, this is very important. Yet history doesn't his story doesn't talk about our story. They will tell you that, oh, is you know, no way women could be that influential. But there was for thousands and thousands of years, it was this way. OK, near as near as archaeology can now determine the changes began in approximately 15,000 to 12,000 BCE and continued to completion by 2400 BCE. At this time, in succeeding migration waves, northern hunting tribes moved south, conquering the goddess matriarchies and destroying them. They brought the order that we know today, patriarchal world culture with this misogynist male God and biases against women who were the images and form of the conquered goddess. The era of great purity as it was known in China. Okay, we were in our golden state. 
before this happened. The human human consciousness was in its golden age. We were very more more aware and conscious in that in in that age. The age of peace and women's autonomy. The age of goddess was over. You heard it there. While no artifacts of weapons have been discovered in any of the goddess archaeological sites on several continents. And that I, that I, I, I disagree with that. Because they have found artifacts of women with protruding vulvas and protruding bellies or uh, the protruding lips. They have found that on different con continents. Uh, the northern invader tribes had metal, weaponry, horses, and war chariots. The destruction was eventual and total. By the time written history, as we know it, began in the Middle East and Asia, only distorted the remnants of the civilizations remain. Early written exhortations to suppress women were warnings to suppress the goddess, lest she rise again to reclaim her own lands and cultures. Like I said, the woman, the land belonged to the woman. It always has because we had this connection with plants and nature and Mother Earth. So we were cultivators of the land. Okay? The patriarchal takeover was perhaps the first and most profound of world wars. I said that. It was. It, it, it changed. It shifted the consciousness on this planet when that happened. It, it totally shifted the consciousness. The greatest war revolution of any time. Traces of a struggle remain for women who seek to find them. The artifacts are powerful and prov provocative. They are finally being interpreted by archaeologists who are women who have no vested interest in patriarchy. Emerging with the clay and stone figures of the large-breasted pregnant goddesses in the realization of the female as divine and a woman-oriented peace and life-oriented world order that's been lost. Like I said, it was, it was more peace. It wasn't a, a world based on war. Now we have a a world that is is based on war. I mean, ready to go into war. We don't have a world that's ready to understand and provide more solutions of peace. It's always ready to go to war. Um, so, you know, look at that. War is money. All right? This is about resources. Usually when there's a war, there's it's, it's about resources. It's about gaining some. It's about money. And we were living in a world that was about uh, living in peace. Loving each other. And learning how to do that uh, in the major art culture. All right? History in the meantime has been a series of invasions against the female. Once the leaders of the civilization Women became breeders and housekeepers without autonomy or voice, isolated from each other and from the workings of society. Some patriarchal countries and religions even denied that women had souls. Women worldwide were kept uneducated, dominated, while the thousands of years of culture were taken over by male establishments or lost altogether. Female learning and history were systematically destroyed as evidenced in the burning of libraries at Alexandria and other places and in the burnings later of women themselves. Nine million or more in Europe from the 13th to the 17th century, once women were decimated, the slave trade, colonial, and missionary movements continued the process of destruction in the remaining goddess cultures. The takeover was universal, but somehow women have survived along with women's peaceful, life-oriented values and women's divinity, the goddess. And so you heard it there. You see how that just led, it just led to more stuff once they were able to overthrow that matriarch culture. Goddess women were the healers, counselors, midwives, scientists. They have continued in these roles despite the oppression of patriarchal take uh, patri uh, patriarchal order 
the Wiccan religion went underground becoming highly secret with groups and members separated from each other, but it continued and survived. Slaves abducted to the New World from Africa brought their religion with them, and though forbidden to practice it, they did so underground or fused it with Christianity that was forced upon them. Native American religions continue in the same ways. In China, a, a women's written language survived for thousands of years, known only to women and used in great secrecy. Women in all cultures taught their daughters the old ways, often at great risk, and kept the goddess and women values alive. The remnants of the goddess matriarchies remain in folklore, literature, archaeology. Okay, they say, they're saying archaeology, mythology, healing, and in women's oral tradition. Too much has been lost and distorted, but much remains. So you never hear her once mention history. She's mentioning archaeology. So uh, go back and look at those videos. Like she was so on target. I love this book because she confirmed. Uh, it's something how the ancestors deal with me. They'll tell me things and I won't believe it. And I just took a leap of faith to share uh, that insight that the ancestral mother shared with me. I took a leap of faith to share it with you. Uh, because the message was so strong in my spirit. I was like, I got to share these insights that you guys are sharing with me and now here i see a book on it that i'm sharing with you about what they share with me uh someone asked me on a, on the channel when when they were looking at it on one of my videos about the amazon women the matriarch culture matriarch the patriarch she someone asked me what book was i reading from and i didn't even respond because these were insights from the ancestral mothers and i trust the ancestors and I trust where spirit is leading me. And, and with spirit, most times you have to trust. Sometimes you don't have to, you don't have a book. You're learning to trust something that you don't see. And that's what this path is about. So uh, it's nice to see that in this book. Uh, I think it's the other page is page 68 in this book. I'm going to share and then I'm going to close out. I don't want to keep you long. This is a really good book. Uh, I do recommend it. There's a lot of rituals in here. Uh, there's a lot of uh, rituals for your, for menstruating women, for women that's going through menopause, telling you when how to use the moon. If you're women that's going through menopause, uh, you you are uh, more likely to use use that waning moon, which is associated with the crone. Uh, you can use the full moon for other healing things, but that is where you'll have more connection with for the women that's going through menopause. There's a ritual for that. There's also a ritual for women who are menstruating uh, and for uh, girls who have just come into womanhood and have just started menstruating. So if you're interested in doing uh, a special ritual for your daughter and when she starts ministrating, there's a ritual in this book for that as well. Like I said, this is an all, all the way around uh, great book, you know, especially when it comes to women and connecting with that, uh, connecting with your goddess. Uh, I think it's a great book. It sure, it sure gave me some insight and I really love that she addressed all goddess cultures, not just um, the Wiccan, but she looked at the African and she looks at Egyptian and she allows you to adapt these rituals according to your culture. So I thought this, this was a very good book uh, for that. Okay, so uh, the I'm reading chapter four, The Moon and Women's Lives. I thought this was a powerful chapter. This is chapter four. Uh, and then I'm going to close out. And you know, you guys, I can be long-winded and, and talk about this for a while, but I don't want to be uh, today. I'm going to try to keep it as short as I can, but this is a really, really good book. Uh, like I said, it gave me so much insight what the ancestral mothers had shared with me. Uh, that energy is so powerful and so strong and raw and primitive uh, and also loving and caring. Um, and so when you when you think about that, you look at Oya. But when you look at on the other side how loving it can be, you look at Oshun. 
you look at Israeli Frida. Um, so I, I really, I really resonated with it, with what she was saying in this book. The goddess and moon are one, and the moon is the center of the women's being. The 28 half day lunar cycle is the cycle of women's menstruation, fertility, and menopause. It was the first form counting in calendars, the first marking of time beyond the day and night. And I tell you, when you start looking at the almanac, the almanac is based on, on when you look at that, the almanac shows you when to plant seed. And planting seed is based on the phases of the moon, when the tides will rise to be able to water and fertilize the seed. So when you look at the first almanac, you're looking at the, that, that, that goddess, echoes of that goddess culture, because the almanac is based on the movement of the moon. That's really, and you'll see that uh, on the calendar as well. They're going to tell, usually on most calendars, they're going to tell you when it's a full moon. Why is that? The biggest questions to ask is why is why are they doing that? Those are echoes of a matriarch culture that you're seeing there. Okay? The words for moon are both words for ministration and the names of the goddess. Every culture has its moon goddess. And the goddess of the moon is the goddess of women. Water, birth, ministration, the ties, and healing. The moon goddess, the great mother, is often imaged as a sea creature, serpent, or mermaid. The beginnings of religion were based on the cycles of the moon. I just told you that. Which beginnings of religion were based on the cycles of the moon, which were also the cycles of women's bodies personified. They became the goddess who, as the charge says, is queen of all women. Women are tied to the moon, are part of her, and the moon is part of our women's lives. Patriarchy has erased women's cycles and replaced the moon with the sun. I talked about that, that sun god. Okay, we got we get into we got get get into that sun god. They created that, and she goes into that like I, I love this Arthur because she is on so many things. You guys, I'm sorry I'm on my soapbox right now. I'm trying not to keep you long, but this is a great great book because uh, it confirmed what the ancestral mothers. I, I don't know. I resonated with it because I had already got insights into it. And note, however, that many of the now male sun gods were originally sun goddesses. Yes, you'll see that. You you can look that look that up. You can see that in the Egyptian pantheon. They, there's echoes in there. Uh, they built, built temples. You'll see in lower and upper Egypt, they replaced a lot of goddesses' temples with these sun gods when these pharaohs became more popular. So it's very, uh, you can see it very um, clearly in the Egyptian pantheon when you start looking at the goddesses in there. And start looking at their ancient roles, you'll see uh, that they were sun goddesses as well. Okay, men have made the moon into something to shoot at and use it as a refused dump. The killing of the dragon in male mythology is a universal metaphor for the destruction of the moon goddess and the goddess matriarchies and for the suppression of women. You heard it here. Marduk is dismembered. Tiamat, the great goddess. Beowulf killed Grendel and Grendel's mother. And St. Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland. Women bodies have gone the way of the conquered moon. Administration is something shameful in patriarchy. With pregnancy and menopause made, made illness by male medicine. Patriarchal religions declare women bodies unclean and use that to justify the enslavement of women. Yeah, I'm telling you, when you look at this human trafficking, the more I look at human trafficking, I relate to this patriarch uh, society because uh, that didn't happen until patriarchy took control. Okay, your human trafficking became very prevalent. All right. And you still seeing it today. It's called human trafficking. Women even today have even taught to deny their own cycles, forcing their bodies 
to imitate men or be rejected as people in male-run world. In the days of Moon Mother, the days before patriarchy, it was not this way. The moon goddess, the serpent, is the creator of the universe and earth in cultures worldwide. The serpent, snake, and moon are both metaphors for change or in the lunar menstrual, menstrual cycles. The sea is the source of all life and the moon rules her tides. Women's blood tastes of salt and water. In the Near East, the moon goddess is Tiamat, the sea dragon. In Yoruba, West Africa, she is Yamaya, described as a mermaid. She is known as Kuan Yin in China, Rainbow Serpent in Australia, and the old woman who never dies in Souk's culture. Some of her other names are Selene, Crete, and in Greece, Kota uh, Cube in Aztec, or Targetis in Syria, and Chachitolik, mistress of rains and rivers in South America. Jazana in Africa, Isis in Egypt and in Greece, Nina or Nana in Suma and Azami in Japan, Shakti in India and Gaia in Greece and Venus and in Rome. These are all water or serpent goddesses and these are, these are dozens more of them. In Polynesia, Moon goddess, creator of the world, is called Hena, which means moon. All women are called in her image. Wayhines. In Scandinavia, the creator is Lunatar, Luna, the moon, or Moradal, moon shining over sea. The moon goddess is also three forms goddess of maiden, mother, and crone, the waxing, full, and waning moon. In her three aspects as a triple goddess, she is all giving and all mo taking mother. Okay, so you heard it here. Uh, very good book. I do recommend it. Like I said, it gave me some insights. Uh, the only thing I didn't like the book, I didn't like I didn't like the way she kind of outlined the rituals in here, the format, how it's listed in the book. I didn't like that. Uh, but other than that, I think this was a great book. I do recommend it. Uh, this is a good, you know, again, this is the casting of, of uh, Casting the Circle by Diane Steen, Women's Book of Ritual. This is another, if you're in Ifa and uh, you're interested in Ifa and you, um, you already know what you want to do, this is a good book as well. And these are just, this is, you know, I'm just giving you some ideas because she also, you know, you know, she does uh, encourage women to use their own spiritual practice as well in tapping into their own inner goddess. And uh, this lady here, she does, um, she is from the Aoife spiritual practices. So she knows about the connecting with the goddess through a yami. All right. And those are basically another term. I hate to use that. Uh, African witches, basically. Another name for African witch. I hate to say that, but I'm just breaking it down to make it simple. Okay, so this is a good book. Um, like I said, I like some of it and some of it I didn't resonate with. Okay, uh, and that just works for me. Jambalaya really deals with um, Ifa, Voodoo, uh, and a little bit of Catholicism. So um, this is a really good book as well. I liked it. I just think some of the things in here are... A really old school, you know, if you're into that type of thing. And some of them are up to date, but it's really some good stuff in here as well, if you're interested. And I did a book review on this book as well. So I thank you so much for being here with me today. I can't wait for my next book review. Uh, it's going to be awesome because we're going to be talking about ancestors again. So I can't wait to come here and talk to you about that. Thank you for being here with me today, loved ones. I hope this book review was insightful. I hope it was helpful and very informative uh, for you. Uh, like I said, thanks for being here today. Thank you for uh, following us new subscribers. Thank you for your support subscribers for liking and sharing our videos. 
Light and love. Namaste. Ashe. May the ancestors be with you, loved ones. Light and love.